Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Red Eagle Politics. Make sure you like this video down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new. So right here on the screen, as you can see, we have our primary calendar for all of the 2022 midterms primaries. And as you can see, we're pretty much done. I mean, we have Florida and New York tomorrow and the Oklahoma runoffs, and we're going to be talking about them in this video. But after that, besides maybe New Hampshire, there's nothing. There's not really a competitive race on the Republican side in Massachusetts or Delaware or Rhode Island that's going to be super consequential, maybe a little bit for the second district there in Rhode Island. We'll you know monitor it when it happens. Same thing with New Hampshire. But other than that, there's nothing. And we have gotten through a lot of the primaries. I'll probably do a video at some point analyzing if the America First authentic conservatives ended up having a good primary cycle because there's been a lot of good and, you know, a little bit of not so good throughout the process. But in terms of what's left, we really have nothing. We've come a long way. We're going basically full general election mode at this point. But still, tomorrow, there's going to be two primaries in two very large pivotal states for the midterms, Florida, because of congressional races. And we'll monitor the margins for the governorship and the Senate. And then in the state of New York, mainly for congressional districts. As you guys know, New York had their primary for the statewide races during June 28th. They were supposed to have the congressional races on that day as well, but the map was so bad that the Democrats drew that even the Democrat Cuomo appointed Supreme Court in the state decided to side nearly unanimously with the Republicans and uh, had them redraw the map. And now it's arguably a better map than it is now. Uh, so Republicans are going to gain a couple of uh, House districts in the midterms based off of that just alone, that court decision. But furthermore, we're going to dive into this and look at the competitive races. But before we get started, I have to tell you guys about our latest sponsor over at the Support the Second Coin. You know it better than anybody that our Second Amendment in this country is under attack by the Democrats and the left. So what better way to support gun owners and gun rights and the Second Amendment than to get your Second Amendment coin. It's free if you cover shipping. You get 10 per person max. It's a promotion to celebrate their grand opening of the website. And all of their orders are fulfilled within 24 hours on average. Get yours at the link in the description down below. But furthermore, Florida and New York, a lot of primaries to get to. I'm not going to touch base on the governor or Senate primaries. There is really no opposition to Ron DeSantis. There really is no opposition either to Marco Rubio. Both will win their primaries easily. There's really no surprise there. On the Dem side, you have... Charlie Crist going up against Nikki Freed for the Democrat nomination. And that one could be closer, but I think that Crist is favored. Uh, either way, they will lose to DeSantis by around 10. Freed might lose by closer to 15 because she's just a total nut job. And then on the Democrat side for the Senate race, Val Demings will likely win that nomination. But in terms of New York, there's some primaries there, and we'll get to them. But we're going to start off with Florida and look at some of the House primaries that are a little bit more competitive. We're going to start off with the 4th Congressional District, where on the Republican side, you have Eric Aguilar, who is facing Aaron Bean, who is the president pro tempore of the Florida Senate, as well as John Chuba, who is also in that race in what is to be an open primary for the Republicans here. And it seems as if all of the party establishment is coalescing behind Aaron Bean. He's doing very well in the polls, and he will likely end up winning uh, the primary and the general election. However, if he is bad, if he falls short, uh, when the time comes, it may be worth looking into primarying him out in 2024. But we'll just have to wait and see. So we're going to go down to the 7th district here which is Stephanie Murphy's current seat, but it's been redrawn, and it's much more a Republican favorable right now. And Stephanie Murphy is not running, and the Republican field is wide open, and it's really coming down to a race between Corey Mills and Anthony Sabatini. Corey Mills is a grifter, the same guy that photoshops a picture of himself on a picture of himself with Trump that he paid $50,000 to get just so he can appear like he has Trump's endorsement and just so he can like appear taller than he really is. It's horrendous Photoshop, not even like close to being accurate either. It's just absolutely pathetic. The guy is, you know, used to run a defense contracting firm. He's going to be a total neocon if he gets in there going up against Anthony Sabatini, who 
is a state representative, by far the most conservative America first state representative in the entire Florida state house. He's also somebody that's calling for an immigration moratorium, a ban to child drag shows. Is somebody that understands that you need to use power to get things done in this country, to save this country. He's willing to, you know, go the extra mile just to do it. He's pretty epic. He's great on every single issue, and we need him. And we need him to defeat the grifter known as Corey Mills. Now, Trump is not endorsed for this race. It is uh, yet to be seen if he will endorse. Uh, hopefully, if he does, he doesn't endorse Corey Mills and goes out there and endorses Anthony Sabatini, who has a very impressive slate of endorsements from what we can tell. But furthermore, uh, we're going to be going down to the 11th district where there is another possibility that an incumbent could get primaried out. And you have Daniel Webster, who is running, and then you have Laura Loomer, the provocateur and activist uh, reporter who has been basically banned from all social media. She ran for the 21st district, got the Trump endorsement in 2020 in Trump's district, ended up losing, uh, but lost by the same margin that Trump lost by against a very entrenched incumbent, despite her being very controversial. And in regards to Daniel Webster, uh, he is somebody that's kind of, you know, run of the mill. He could be caught off guard. Loomer is winning some straw polls in the villages, like 90 to 10, but you always can't go off of those. But it's still a race to watch. It's going to be interesting to see what happens at the end of the day in that district. If she does end up beating Webster and goes to Congress, she'll definitely be a very staunch advocate uh, to end deplatforming on big tech social media platforms because it's been her main issue and it's affected her arguably more than a lot of people, I guess you would say. So, the 13th district in Florida, this is Charlie Chris Old District, and on the Republican side, you have uh, a race that is shaping up to be relatively competitive, mainly between Anna Paulina Luna and Kevin Hazlett. Luna was the nominee last time, and she supported DACA, but she's changing her tune. Now, is that a genuine change of tune, or is she just grifting? It has really been yet to be seen. She has a mixed bag regarding her endorsement slate. There are some good endorsements on that list. There are also some you know, iffy or not so good endorsements on that endorsement list. Uh, but either way, she's probably going to win the nomination. She has Trump's endorsement. Uh, however, if she is weak when she gets in there, uh, it is very, very imperative that she could get primaried out. And Kevin Hazlitt's no better, and his slate of endorsements is far more establishmentarian. So do keep that in mind. Either way, not really impressed with a single candidate in this given race. But going down to the 15th district where you have your next competitive primary, Laura Lee uh, seems to be uh, running away with the open seat so far. Uh, we'll really wait and see what happens at the end of the day, but she apparently is doing a lot better in this race than Kelly Stargell or any of the other characters that are running. Uh, and now we're going to go down to the 27th district, which is something that is worth looking into as well, despite the fact that it's not really being talked about a lot, but you have a very weak incumbent who sides with the left on most things in Maria Elvira Salazar. And she is somebody who has caved on a lot of social issues, including gun control. She didn't vote for impeachment. She's not a member of the impeachment 10, but has been, you know, very critical of, of Trump. I believe she voted for the 1-6 commission in a district that voted for Trump by seven points, by the way. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, she's a good fit for her district. I disagree. I think that her district is moving to the right, not because of, oh, well, because Republicans are starting to cave on abortion and gun control like Salazar does. No, it's Salazar's own problem. And Frank Polo, he's another Cuban-American individual. He is primarying her out. He hasn't gotten a lot of, you know, high-profile endorsements, hasn't gained a whole lot of traction, but we'll, we'll see on election night if he's able to get it relatively close, because if he gets in like the 40% range, then you know, you know, maybe he'll run again in 2024, and this district could be a future primary target for Republicans. But I wanted to move on to New York uh, and look at some of the primaries there, mainly the first district for the Republicans, because this one is shaping up to be a very competitive race, because you have Nicola Loda, a lot of the party, uh, you know, establishment backers, the party of Suffolk County, and then a lot of state senators and assemblymen have backed him up. Then you have Michelle Bond, who's endorsed by Ted Cruz. That really doesn't mean a whole lot. Ted Cruz makes some good endorsements here and there, and he also makes a lot of bad endorsements 
uh, here and there as well when he's endorsing people for Senate or for Congress, etc. Uh, this cycle, he's made more bad endorsements than not in regards to his support for Josh Mandel and David McCormick in Ohio and Pennsylvania, respectively. She's also endorsed by Don Jr. Don Jr. has, uh, I guess you would say he's improved his endorsement game, but the full effect of it is really yet to be seen. But either way, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in this primary for this seat, which again, this seat is supposed to go Republican, especially because of the midterm cycle that we're in now, but we'll see when the time comes. But going down to the 10th district. I wanted to go down to the 10th because the 10th district is in a Democrat primary that Donald Trump did a little bit of trolling in and made an endorsement. He endorsed Dan Goldman in the primary for this district, who is actually primarying out Mondaire Jones uh, from the right on the Democrat side, which is very interesting. And you saw this with Ilan Omar uh, in her district. A lot of these like Bernie bro far left types are not doing so hot in their primaries. And Ilan Omar faced a challenger that was relatively low name recognition, didn't have that much of an operation going, and he only ended up losing to her by like three percentage points. And she got by in her primary fairly easily in 28, or not 2018, but 2020, and she got caught off guard a little bit. And Mondaire Jones, a lot of people are saying he's going to lose to Dan Goldman, who's the former assistant U.S. attorney for Southern District in New York, which is the district that, you know, a lot of Democrats want to investigate Trump until, like, I guess the year 3000. But either way, Goldman got Trump's endorsement, which is funny. He's doing a little bit of trolling. He's just interfering in their primaries because, again, he's just somebody, he's sitting back there, he's playing golf, he just, you know, wants to be a part of politics. He will be again when he reassumes the White House after winning the 2024 election in, you know, January of 2025. But as of right now, he's not even just, you know, endorsing Republicans that support his agenda. He's meddling in the Dem primary, and he's also sending mixed signals, one could say, but he's, uh, you don't know if he's like doing this to help the far left candidate or what his real motivation is, but it even holds true regarding the 12th district. Uh, and then we'll get back to the 11th, which is the uh, last one I wanted to talk about, but you have Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. And Jerry Nadler, Trump praised both of them uh, in a very trolling, funny manner, but he endorsed at the end of the day, Carolyn Maloney, and she like rejected his endorsement. It was so funny. And it just like, it's it just dictating how some of these primaries and how some of these people are just like, you know, just throwing shots at each other over, you got Trump's endorsement. Oh, I didn't, I disavowed Trump's endorsement and just like crazy. But Either way, it's funny, and this is definitely happening in Trump's old backyard in New York. You know, he didn't really do it in a whole lot of states. I'd like to see him do it more because it's just funny. It's just objectively hilarious uh, what's going on there. And all the people with TDS, maybe they'll vote for the person that uh, Trump is not endorsing because they think Trump wants the other one for some reason. I don't know. I don't think he really does. I just think it's a funny troll. And I hope he does more of it. So I wanted to also touch base on the 11th district because this district is a district that voted for Trump significantly. They were going to draw Staten Island in a blue district. However, they redrew it in a red district after the court order because the map was just so bad that the Cuomo Supreme Court <laughs> had to side with the Republicans. But what we do know is that Nicole Maliotakis, she has Trump's endorsement, does not deserve it at all. Uh, quite frankly, she is awful on every issue. She caves on every social issue. I warn people about this back in 2020 that she would end up this way. And as a result, she has ended up this way. And Max Rose is running for his old seat. He's not going to win on the Dem side. He'll win the primary, maybe, but he won't win the general. And Nicole Meliotakis faces a challenger to the right who's endorsed by uh, the New York Young Republican Club, which is an organization that is fairly solid on the issues. Now, Maliotakis probably is going to win because she is not facing any steep opposition and has Trump's endorsement. But at the end of the day, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Does she get, you know, 70% of the vote or 60%? Because either way, she's awful on the issues and she ideally needs to be primaried out in 2024. And this gauges the barometer for doing so in that regard. So, that's it for the House races. I wanted to touch on the Oklahoma special election runoff there because it is very consequential and important whoever wins it. And it was arguably a foregone conclusion because in the first round, as we could see here, uh, Mark Wayne Mullany did very well in his district and he, you know, advanced to the runoff. He got 44%. He probably got like 60 in his district and like 30 
outside of his district or so. But either way, he advanced to the next round. T.W. Shannon also advanced to the next round, and they're going to a runoff. And Mark Wayne Mullen is a neocon through and through. He is somebody that is a staunch advocate for sending aid to Ukraine. He, he is somebody that wants to get involved in foreign wars. He did his publicity stunt in Afghanistan that was extremely dangerous to raise his profile politically last year in August. And he also has voted for a lot of liberal legislation socially, sided with the Democrats on the reauthorization of VAWA, which put men in women's uh, shelters, etc., now he's running for Senate and he is running against T.W. Shannon, who I don't really think is like the best candidate in the world, like politically issues wise, but he is somebody that's attacked Mullen from the right and he wasn't running a great campaign, but he's starting to get it together. Now, Trump endorsed Mark Wayne Mullen from the onset of it when he was polling in the mid to high 60s. And even then I said, okay, you know, I don't even think Shannon could win with Trump's endorsement. It's not a good endorsement, but you know, it is what it is. He's just trying to pad his record. Now, Shannon's gaining traction. In a poll that came out in late July, uh, he was at, you know, 38%. He was just down by eight points. And then the updated Sooner poll, the same poll that had Mullen up 63.35, now has Mullen up 53.47. So Shannon is still not the favorite. But there's a chance for an upset. And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm saying it could happen. And if it does happen, it would be a very good thing in my opinion. But uh, either way, I'll be streaming tomorrow. We'll watch the results from all three of these states and we'll see what happens. But anyways, guys, thanks for watching this video. Like this video down below, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media. The links are all in the description down below. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.